Hello and welcome to HIVRNA Test Guide Podcast, your trusted source for HIV testing, with over 4,500 plus testing labs across the United States. Today we are digging into, well, one of the biggest medical challenges we still face as a planet. Absolutely, HIV. Right. Now, thanks to amazing antiretroviral treatments, millions are living long, healthy lives with HIV. That's huge progress. It really is. But treatment isn't prevention. Exactly. And despite, what, decades of intense effort, a truly effective, protective vaccine, it's still out there. The big, unmet need. It's sort of the holy grail in infectious disease research, isn't it? Virus is still spreading, and treatment, powerful as it is, just isn't enough on its own. We need prevention. We do. So the mission for this deep dive is to look at a really interesting new path. It's an approach detailed in a recent study, uh, Science Translational Medicine. Mm -hmm. And we're basically asking, can the technology that works so well for COVID-19, the mRNA platform, can it finally give us the workaround we need for HIV? Because HIV is notoriously difficult. Yeah, it's a great question. So we're going to unpack how these researchers used mRNA to train outsmart HIV's uh, very clever defenses. We'll look at the results from animal studies and, importantly, the early human trials. Some really encouraging stuff there. But not all straightforward. No, definitely not. We also absolutely have to talk about a surprising safety signal that popped up. And then there's the whole policy picture, which is, frankly, a bit confusing right now. Okay, let's get into it. Starting at the beginning, why has it been so incredibly hard to make an HIV vaccine for decades. Well, it really boils down to the main target on the virus. It's called the HIV envelope protein, or M for short. That's the spike protein, right? Like on the coronavirus. Kind of, yeah. It's the part sticking out that antibodies need to grab onto to stop the virus from getting into our cells. But ENV, ENV is a master of disguise, a real escape artist. How so? What are its tricks? Well, first it mutates constantly unbelievably fast. Uh -huh. So the virus is always changing its look. Just when your immune system thinks it's got a lock on it, poof, it shifts. So any antibodies you make might quickly become useless. Exactly. They become obsolete fast. Second, the protein physically hides its most vulnerable spots. It hides them? Yeah, it sort of folds in on itself or covers up the key regions, the bits that should trigger the best immune response. Okay. And third, just to make things even harder, the whole thing is covered in this dense coat of sugars, like biological camouflage. Wow. So it sounds less like a simple target and more like a, like a fortress wrapped in fog. That's a good way to put it. The source material had a great analogy, I thought. Oh, yeah. They called ENV like a cake under one of those glass domes. Huh. Okay, I get that. So the antibodies can see the tasty cake, the protein, but they can't actually reach your important bits unless... Someone lifts the dome. Precisely. And for years, standard vaccines, they just couldn't reliably lift that dome. They either couldn't get the immune system to focus on the right spots, or the antibodies ended up just sticking to the sugary fluff on the outside. Not very useful. Right. Which brings us to this new mRNA approach. How did these researchers try to use mRNA to essentially lift that glass dome? Okay, so the basic idea, it's similar to the COVID vaccines. The mRNA gives your cells instructions to make a piece of the virus. The end of protein in this case. The end protein, yes. But here's the crucial tweak, the really clever part. Yeah. They didn't just tell the cells to make any envil protein. They designed instructions for a membrane-bound version. Membrane-bound, meaning it sticks to the cell surface. It doesn't just float off. Exactly. It anchors itself right there in the cell membrane. Why is that important? Because that mimics how the end protein actually sits on the real virus much more closely. It forces the protein to hold its natural three-part shape its trimeric structure oh okay so it's not just about making the protein it's about making it look exactly like it does on the live virus that's the key insight that structural faithfulness the hope was that by showing the immune system this more authentic virus-like version it would train it to make antibodies that hit the really critical functional spots the spots needed for neutralization lifting the dome basically by showing the immune system exactly where the vulnerable parts of the cake are you got it. Less distraction from the sugar coat, more focus on the important structure underneath. Okay, so the design sounds smart. Let's talk results. Did this clever trick work in practice? What did they see in the trials? Well, the early results were definitely promising, especially uh, when it came to the type of antibodies produced. Right. In animal studies, rabbits and monkeys 
this membrane-bound N vaccine did generate high levels of neutralizing antibodies. And just to be super clear, neutralizing antibodies are the ones that actually stop the virus from infecting cells, yeah. right? Not just flag it. Exactly. They block the key. They stop it at the door. And what was really encouraging was that the vaccine produced very few off-target antibodies. Meaning? Meaning the immune response was really focused. It wasn't wasting energy making antibodies against the less important parts or just the sugar coat. It was hitting the right spots. Did the mRNA platform show its speed advantage like we saw with COVID? It seems so. Some monkeys developed these good neutralizing responses after just three doses. Three doses. That's quite fast for HIV vaccine work, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, the researchers noted that this kind of quick, strong response is not typically seen with other types of vaccines for HIV. So that was a definite plus for this specific mRNA design. Okay, neutralizing antibodies, good speed. What else? Maybe the most exciting part, scientifically, was the T-cell response. <gasps> The killer T cells. Yes. The vaccine triggered really robust killer T cell responses. These are the cells that hunt down and destroy cells already infected with the virus. And that's something mRNA vaccines seem particularly good at stimulating, much more so than traditional protein vaccines, right? Why is that? It's about how the target protein is presented to the immune system. Traditional vaccines often just inject the protein itself, which mostly hangs around outside cells. That's great for waking up B cells, the antibody factories. Okay. But killer T cells, they like to see the protein pieces, the antigens, presented on the surface of our own cells as if the cell is infected. Because mRNA tells our own cells to make the end of E protein. The protein gets processed inside the cell and then displayed on the outside. Exactly. It's the perfect signal to activate those killer T cells. So you're training both the antibody defenders and the search and destroy T cell crews. That feels like a much more comprehensive defense, especially for a sneaky virus like HIV. It's a major advantage. So this approach then moved into the first human trial, HVTN302. What happened there? Oh, well, yeah, the big step. Well, the early results confirmed it was feasible in people. And importantly, some participants did develop those key neutralizing antibodies after three doses. In humans. In humans. Mm -hmm. The researchers called it an important milestone. It showed the basic principle, this membrane-bound idea, could work in people, too. Okay, that does sound like genuine progress, a real step forward after so many attempts. It is. Definitely grounds for optimism. But you mentioned a wrinkle. We need to inject some caution here, right? The human trial wasn't perfectly smooth sailing. There was a safety signal. That's right. Cautious optimism is definitely the phrase. While the vaccine did what it was supposed to do immunologically, HVTN302 did throw up an unexpected safety issue. Okay. What was it? About 7% of the participants, that was 7 people out of 108, mm. developed a rash after getting the vaccine. 7%? That's not tiny. And a rash isn't usually listed as a standard mild vaccine side effect like a sore arm. What was concerning about this rash? Two things. Mainly, its persistence and the fact that researchers couldn't quite figure out why it was happening. Persistence? Yeah. In four of those seven people, the rash actually lasted for up to a year. A oh, year. Well, mm -hmm. Now, the good news is the reactions were generally manageable with things like antihistamines. But the mystery was the cause. They couldn't nail it down. Were they thinking it was a reaction to the NVI protein itself, maybe because it's presented in this specific membrane-bound way? Or was it the delivery system, the lipid nanoparticles, the LMPs that carry the mRNA? That's the big question they're still investigating. Hmm. It could be something specific about the complex HIV NVI protein being stuck on the cell membrane like that. Right. Or it could point to some kind of inflammatory reaction involving the LNP delivery system itself. Maybe something unique when combined with this particular mRNA message. Interesting. So the platform isn't just plug and play. Not at all. It really highlights how complex these new vaccine technologies are. We're still learning exactly how the body interacts with these sophisticated delivery packages, especially long term. This rash, this persistent one, signals some kind of biological interaction we need to understand and fix before thinking about wider use. So the mechanism for making the right immune response seems to work, which is huge. But the delivery vehicle might still need some tweaking for this specific application. And those four people are still being monitored, obviously. Absolutely. It underscores that cautious optimism. It's a success, yes, but with a significant asterisk that needs more work. Okay, so we have this cutting-edge science making real headway on a decades-old problem using one of our newest, most powerful tools. But then, when we zoom out from the lab to the policy world, things get weird, contradictory even. Yeah, 
This is probably the most puzzling part of the whole story right now. Yeah. You have this clear promise, not just for HIV, but potentially using mRNA for flu, cancer, other tough diseases. Right. The potential seems massive. And yet the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, HHS, announced back in August that they were essentially going to wind down major federal funding for mRNA vaccine development. Wind down. After mRNA was the hero of the COVID pandemic, that sounds odd. How big a cut are we talking about? It's significant. Canceling or cutting short projects worth nearly half a billion dollars, almost $500 million. Wow. And the reason HHS gave? They cited concerns about the effectiveness of mRNA vaccines. Hold on. Effectiveness. Didn't we just establish and didn't the sources confirm that the COVID mRNA vaccines were incredibly successful, safe and effective at preventing severe disease and death? That's the contradiction right there. Yeah. Our source material explicitly states they were proven to be safe, and have been extremely successful against SARS-CoV-2. So how can they justify massive cuts based on effectiveness concerns? Is it specific to this HIV vaccine effort? Or are they questioning the whole platform for future uses beyond COVID? It's unclear from the rationale provided, which makes it confusing. Mm -hmm. It suggests the reasoning might be, well, flawed, or perhaps influenced by other things. Like what? Politics? Budget issues? pandemic fatigue setting in? It's hard to say definitively, but whatever the reason, the impact is pretty clear. Pulling half a billion dollars from this kind of foundational research, it really risks stalling future innovation, not just for HIV, but across the board. Yeah. The researchers cited in our sources were very direct about this. Their conclusion was, quote, stopping research is never the right answer. It feels short-sighted. It really does. So you've got this incredibly powerful tool, the mRNA platform, making breakthroughs against one of humanity's toughest viruses. Mm -hmm. And simultaneously, the government agency funding much of this basic science pulls back based on this vague effectiveness concern that seems to contradict the biggest real-world test case we have. It's a jarring disconnect. It really makes you think about future preparedness. Yeah. If we decide sort of prematurely to limit research on a platform like mRNA, we might not have the tools ready for the next big health crisis, whether that's another pandemic or finally cracking a disease like HIV that needs this kind of technological leap. Precisely. The takeaway seems to be that basic science, especially for powerful new platforms, needs consistent long-term backing. It can't just be turned on and off based on immediate crises or shifting sentiments. Okay. Well, this deep dive has certainly covered a lot of ground from the tiny details of the HIV NV protein's defenses and the cleverness of the membrane-bound mRNA design, all the way up to these big, complex policy choices that shape the future of the research itself. I think the core thing to take away is that this membrane-bound mRNA approach is a genuine technical step forward. It managed to guide the immune system, both antibodies and T cells, in a much more targeted way against HIV than we've seen before. That's a real achievement given how evasive this virus is. Yeah, it's fascinating how the scientific complexity, like that persistent rash in a few participants, which is a real hurdle, but part of innovation. Right, bumps in the road. How that mirrors the political complexity, like the sudden funding cuts. Both represent challenges, but only one seems to be actively choosing to limit the potential here. Well said. Knowledge needs understanding, but it also needs resources to be applied. Which really leaves us and you listening with this final thought to chew on. If a brand new technology shows real promise against one of history's most difficult medical challenges, like HIV, but at the same time, major funding gets pulled because of vague worries about effectiveness. What other future health threats, ones we can't even see yet, are we potentially leaving ourselves unprepared for by deciding too early to put limits on such a foundational scientific platform?